Kia ora tato, everybody, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I know it's a really busy time of the year for the, in the farming calendar, so I um, really value you you're joining us today to hear about the Essential Freshwater Package. What we have in front of us is a whole lot of change on a very complex subject and at a time when we don't actually have much time to be able to make a submission. So a very short time period for us to get our head around this and to actually make a submission. And while the policies impact all New Zealanders, both rural and urban, of course, a lot of these changes need to be made on farm. And while, like I said, there are policies here for the urban community as well, those changes will be made by district councils and regional councils. So for us, there is a big impact on, on our businesses and on our communities because of all the changes that we need to be making potentially. The package also comes at a time when the primary sector is already under a lot of pressure and off the back of many other policies which have also been implemented recently. For example, the Zero Carbon Bill and also immigration, MBOVIS and a whole lot of other stuff. So yes, we are concerned about this, but at the same time, it's not all bad news. A lot of these policies we can support. We are after improving water quality outcomes as a sector. We know this is important for our farms, for our communities and for our consumers. And especially where these policies build off all the good work that farmers are already doing, that's great news. For example, farm plans and stock exclusion. But the deal is in the detail and the detail is complex. And we wanna make sure the detail is underpinned by robust science, by a really good understanding to make sure we have meaningful outcomes downstream in the river systems, to make sure we have time to be able to make the changes that are required and to make sure those changes are practical and also that we understand the implications of these changes on the community and on our regional economies. So today's webinar is all about that detail and we hope to provide you a bit more information around what's sitting in behind these policies in terms of what's the intent, what's the process, what are the key proposals and how they impact you on the farm and what DRNZ's key positions are on some of these policy documents. And more importantly, we also wanna talk about what we would like you to do to help us and the dairy sector in making submissions on these proposed documents. There will also be plenty of time for questions which we you can ask via email. So the overall intent of um, this document is twofold. The first is to stop a further degradation in water quality and to start really making an improvement in the next five years. And the second is to really reverse past damage and bring waterways and ecosystems to a healthy state within a generation. The Ministry for the Environment, Minister Parker and Minister O'Connor signalled this policy in October last year and the intention was to have these policies already notified to the public in April earlier this year. But of course we know these policies have been incredibly complicated and hence there's been some delay to actually get this to a notified position. The policies were notified on the 5th of September and like I already indicated the, the times for submission is very very short. Initially, the time was 17 October, but through a work from Dairy NZ and Federated Farmers and other agencies, we've managed to get an extension to the 31st of October for the whole community. And this is important because, like I said, there's a lot of stuff here to get our heads around, and this is very, very complicated. The idea is that the submissions will be collated uh, before the end of the year and go through to an independent panel. And the independent panel will make recommendations to the minister, who will then pass um, law early in the new year, also through cabinet. So we are expecting a final decision on this policy sort of February, March next year in time before the local, before the, the government elections in October. There are six key components that make up this document. And like I said, there's a whole lot of documents which sit underneath this as well. So what you see here in front of you on the screen is the overarching consultation document, but sitting under this is a new national environmental standard, new national objectives framework, and all the various policy documents that sit underneath that. Also, this document has been supported and uh, based on the advice from four independent advisory groups. And these groups have also written their own reports and those reports are also available online. And I think those reports really highlight how complex this really is because of some of those independent reports also disagree with each other. And those, those um, advisory groups include the Freshwater Leaders Group, the Technical Advisory Group, the Regional Council, Stakeholder Working Group, and Ka, Ka Ui Māori Iwi Leaders Group. So the document has six key components and these affect uh, primary, the primary sector and urban environments equally. The first is speeding up implementation. 
So the government would like to ensure that regional council policy processes are sped up. Currently, some of these policy processes take more than 10 years to get through the system, from notification, through to hearings, through to environment court and more hearings. For example, the Rotorua Plan Change 10, which has just gone through the environmental court process with a judgment made uh, about a month ago. And that's been going on for more than 10 years. So at a high level, this do document also through RMA reforms intends to speed up the regional council policy process. The second part is to clarify the policy direction, particularly for regional councils in the community. So incorporating te mana or te wai, putting the water first, and also incorporating iwi values. So the document provides greater clarity around how regional councils could be considering that. The third point is about improving ecosystem health. And this is the overarching integrator of how well the water quality is for a river system. So a whole lot of new metrics are being proposed for regional councils to be able to monitor and measure and assess water quality outcomes based on new attributes. The fourth component is supporting safe drinking water. And this is really in light of what happened in the Havelock North area a couple of years ago. So safeguarding drinking water resources and safeguarding and minimizing the risk on land around those, some of those drinking water um, locations where the, where the water is taken from. The fifth is managing storm and wastewater. And this is a really big deal for district councils in particular in urban environments. So this is trying to understand or bring in um, sort of national regulations on wastewater management, new standards which are integrated and which are consistent across the whole country and dealing with some of the issues around expired resource consents of wastewater point source discharges to waterways. And the last part, which we'll really talk about here today, is improving farm practices. And of course, this has big implications for the dairy sector, but also the entire rural sector. So um, what does it mean for you? So at a high level, we can break um, the policy documents down into these four components. The first component impacts all urban and rural catchments everywhere around the country. So the policy documents proposing new in-stream nutrient concentrations for ecosystem health, new national bottom lines, which all regional councils need to meet, uh, which, sorry, which all regional councils need to implement new plans to deliver on by 2025. And the intention here is that those plans are in place by 2025, so a very short time frame, but the community and the regional councils and whatever decisions they make have up to a generation to actually meet the requirements um, in terms of meeting these standards. And I'll talk more about those standards soon. The second block is really um, rules which impact all farms, whether they be dairy farms or sheep and beef farms, or also horticulture, all around New Zealand, irrespective of which catchment those farms fall in. The first part there is around farm environmental plans. All farms will require a farm environmental plan. The management of intensive activities such as wintering, and also stock exclusion. For some farms, there'll be a no further intensification rule in the interim. And what this means basically is that if there's no regional council policy process in place currently, which prohibits or manages nutrients in those catchments, then no further intensification or conversion of land use to a higher leaching activity is permitted in the interim while the regional councils and the community figures out how to meet the limits in the future. And finally, there is a Schedule 1 um, in the document, and Schedule 1 summarises a list of 16 catchments uh, which will require a focus on re reducing nitrogen for those farmers at the top end of the bell curve, the nitrogen leaching curve, within each individual catchment. By our estimate, 21% of our dairy farms would fall into the Schedule 1 catchments where nitrogen management would be required. I'm now going to talk about the policies which impact all farms and outline our dairy and tech positions in, in the interim on these. Farm environment plans. So as I said, all farms will be required to have a farm environmental plan by 2025. And we think this is a great thing. We know that farm plans are very important for managing environmental risk. And we know there are a lot of benefits for improving water quality, in particular ecosystem health, if every farm has a plan which manages localised risk particularly critical source areas, for example, and puts in measures to manage those risks. And this builds on the story that we are already on, the journey we're already on as a dairy sector. In fact, through Dairy Tomorrow, we've committed to delivering farm plans by 2025 already. And we do believe 
like I said, that this will really get the, the boat going and getting water quality improved across many catchments. But of course, there are two options here. The first is a mandatory approach um, that it becomes in law, or the second is a voluntary or an industry-led approach. And our current dairy and tech position is that this should be a mandatory approach because farm environmental plans will only work if every single dairy farmer, every single sheep and beef farmer, and every single horticultural farmer has a farm plan. And collectively that will lead to the water quality outcomes we're all looking for across these catchments. So yes, we support farm plans, and in principle we support a mandatory approach to make sure that these plans will actually deliver the outcomes for water quality that we're all looking for. The second set of standards are really around um, intensive practices, particularly wintering. And on the screen here, you'll see the proposed wintering um, standards. And there are two options on the table. The first is new national standards through regulation. So a new national environmental standard, which all farmers need to meet if they have wintering activities. The second is, an, is the application of a current industry standard. And the table that you see in front of you here is, is um, the content of the national standard option, the first option. And a lot of this stuff is, is, is great. It builds off the work that we've already done across many catchments and is largely already reflected in our Good Farming Practice Guide for Wintering, which a lot of Southland farmers and South Otago farmers are already following. So for example, having an adequate buffer width between your crop and the waterway is really important making sure you're not wintering uh, on very steep slopes and really managing the runoff of sediment from these blocks. There are, of course, some things in here which we are not too comfortable with. For example, there is a proposed pugging uh, rule requiring a minimum, or sorry, a maximum pugging depth of 20 centimetres. And that in particular is not very practical. And we don't understand how that particular part of the wintering package can be implemented. But at a high level, we do support improvements in wintering practices and we would support a national environmental standard which reflects what we currently have in our own good farming practice documents. Stock exclusion, and of course, um, a lot of dairy farmers, all dairy farmers have been on this journey already for many, many years. So the current proposal is to build off those rules. So the stock exclusion rules apply to waterways which are wider than a metre and deeper than 30 centimetres, which directly corresponds to our dairy water accord definition. The proposal is that all dairy farms and all farms on a slope of less than five degrees have stock exclusion in place for permanent waterways by 2021 for dairy and 2025 for all other farms with a minimum buffer width of two metres. The proposal is suggesting that overall at a farm level, there needs to be an average buffer width of five metres. And if current stock exclusion that's already taken place on that farm doesn't meet that five metre buffer threshold, then farmers have until 2035 to move their fence lines. All small streams would be managed through a farm environmental plan. So we support stock exclusion. We believe it's the, it's the right thing to do. We believe it will lead to a lot of improvements in water quality, particularly ecosystem health, because it targets things such as sediment and E. coli. We propose in principle an average approach, but we're not quite sure about the five metre number. We believe that we're currently looking at the science to understand where that five metre number came from, and we absolutely don't support moving fence lines. We don't believe moving fence lines on existing excluded waterways will lead to huge amounts of benefit downstream um, in terms of water quality, compared to actually managing other sources and other loads in those catchments. So the high level, yes, we support stock exclusion, but we don't support the moving of fences, and we're still looking at the science on the five metre buffer. I'll now talk about some of the, the policies which impact a big chunk of our farms, not all farms, but by our calculation, anywhere between 35 and 47% of our dairy farms. And the most important one here that I'm sure you've heard a lot about in the news already is the proposed in-stream limits for nitrogen and for phosphorus. And these in-stream limits sit alongside the existing limits that are already in place for nitrate toxicity, and that current number is 6.8 milligram per litre and also that some of the limits that are being proposed to manage perifite and biomass. So this in-stream limit would apply to all catchments across the whole country, um, particularly those catchments where there is no perifite or algae growing in those rivers. So it's really to, um, designed to improve ecosystem health outcomes. These limits are very low. 
So the current number is 6.8 in the existing legislation. The new number is one milligram per litre. And the, the, the units are not quite the same. The 6.8 is for nitrate only, whereas the one is for nitrate and ammonium. So there is a large difference here. And this is something that we don't support. And the reason we don't support it is because we, don't have, we haven't seen the detail around the science underpinning these new numbers. So there is no documentation in the report, in the consultation document, showing how these numbers were derived. And we don't believe they are scientifically robust. We do absolutely support managing nitrogen and phosphate for ecosystem health alongside other contaminants such as sediment. But we don't believe that a one milligram per litre threshold around the country will lead to huge benefits for ecosystem health across many catchments. And that's before we start considering the huge social and economic impact of these limits on our communities. This map here of New Zealand shows what this limit would mean. So on the left hand, these, these graphs have been produced by Dairy NZ. So on the left hand side, you'll see nitrogen. Map of New Zealand showing different colours for nitrogen. The grey represents areas of the, of the country where there is no data available to make an assessment. The white represents catchments where this limit is currently already being met. The yellow represents areas where um, catchments exceed the one milligram per litre threshold. So in those catchments, work would be need, need to be undertaken to reduce nitrogen loads. And that process would be the regional councils implementing a new regional uh, plan by 2025 with a long-term target to try and meet these numbers. The orange catchments here represent areas where uh, the limit is exceeded by a factor of two. So that roughly translates to a 50% reduction of nitrogen loss being required on farm with all things being equal to meet that limit. And the catchments marked in red represent areas where that limit is exceeded by a factor of five. And that's, that would require anywhere between a 50 and 80% reduction in nitrogen loading on farm, nitrogen losses on farm, your overseer number, to meet those limits downstream. On the right hand side, you see phosphate, the same color scheme here. So white means no, no change required. Yellow means the limit's exceeded, orange exceeded by a factor of two, and red by a factor of five. And what you'll see here is that 35% of our dairy farms would be impacted by nitrogen, and 47% would be impacted by the phosphate limit. And particularly parts of the volcanic plateau in the North Island, where phosphorus is naturally high because of volcanic soils, you'll see a lot of these catchments currently do not meet that threshold. So this is probably the largest concern that we have with the policy document. We don't believe it's robust, we don't have the detail, we don't understand how these numbers were derived, and we will know that they have a big impact on our communities. The next part which affects many farms would be um, other attributes in the package. So currently there are attributes or things that the regional councils need to measure as a way of assessing whether water quality is, is safe for, for uh, swimming and also whether it meets ecosystem health criteria. And, and we support that at a high level. This document proposes a whole lot of new attributes, a whole lot of new things that the councils need to be having monitoring programs in place for to measure against and start reporting on and also to make sure limits are met. Sediment is a new one of those things that have been added to the list. And we think this is a great thing. We know that sediment is a very important driver of ecosystem health. And we know that from current science by others, that reducing sediment loads to our rivers will lead to improvements in ecosystem health, particularly for aquatic organisms living in those streams. So we absolutely support sediment being added to the list of things that regional councils need to monitor and implement plans to meet. At the same time, there's a whole raft of attributes or measures in here that we don't understand, or we don't understand why they are all needed. So for example, there's a new attribute around ecosystem health, which measures the aquatic biodiversity of insects and streams, aquatic bugs. And we think that's a great thing, but this policy document is, is basically proposing three different versions of that metric. And we don't believe that makes sense. So our, reg, our science team is currently working through this detail and we'll be making submissions on these attributes, particularly around the ones which we believe make sense for regional councils to be measuring and to be assessing performance against and the ones which we believe are going too far or redundant because of some of the other measures already being um, collected. I'll now talk about the policies which affect some farms. And these are farms which either have no current regional council policy plans in place 
or farms which currently um, or, or farms which which currently are sitting on a Schedule One catchment list, and I'll show you a, a map of that soon. The first policy here is of no further intensification rule from June 2020 to ultimately 2025. And this is in the interim. This is while regional councils figure out how they need to meet the new limits with their communities and until the new policy documents are put into place. Intensification in terms of the definition means an increase in land area uh, with increased leaching potential, for example, conversions from forestry to any pastoral or any pastoral to dairy support or dairy support to dairy. So if those activities have an area of greater than 10 hectares, then the no further intensification rule kicks in and a consent would be required. And the consent would need to demonstrate that your existing footprint on your existing farm would not exceed the current baseline condition if you are increasing the area of land for those purposes. The rule also applies to areas of land intensified with irrigation. So if you're increasing the, the, the land area for irrigation by more than 10 hectares or increasing the area of crop by more than 10 hectares or a proportion of your farm area, then this rule would also apply. And at a very high level, we support this. And the reason we support this is because in the interim, and the reason we support this is because we don't want more nutrients going into the system, going into the waterways in, in the interim, while we still figure out the science around what we need to do in the near future. If we do have a situation where more nutrients are going into the system, in a catchment which is clearly over allocated, where we know there's already too much nitrogen, that would mean a whole lot of pain or a lot of, whole lot of extra pain for all farmers, dairy and non-dairy in the future when those limits take effect. So for that reason, we don't support further intensification in the interim. So it's until we have more science, until those plans are finalized in these over allocated catchments. As I mentioned, there are also 16 catchments which are called, which have been bundled into what they call the Schedule 1 catchments. And I apologize for the map, it's not our map, but in purple here you see which catchments fall into that category. And I've got a list of that on the next slide. And in these catchments, basically, the intent is to start reducing nitrogen. So reducing high nitrogen loss to start improving nitrogen concentrations in those waterways. And a number of options are on the table here. The first is a nitrogen cap, and this would follow the Waikato Plan Change 1 approach, where for every single catchment, farmers would be required to submit their overseer number, and those overseer numbers all ranked from low to high in the top quarter or the top 20 or 15%, that number is still open for discussion, would be required to reduce their footprint to match what the average of what everybody else is doing. The second option on the table is a fertiliser cap, and there's very little detail around what that would actually look like. And the third option is a farm environmental plan approach to manage nitrogen. In principle, our position is that, yes, we do need to manage nitrogen. We do need to get on that journey in some of these catchments. But from our perspective, it makes sense to look at nitrogen surplus. So nitrogen surplus would require looking at farmer practices and trying to improve nitrogen use efficiency in the first instance, together with a farm environmental plan as the best way forward. So at the moment, we're still working our way through this position but we are looking at the combination of a nitrogen surplus metric with a farm plan approach as a way forward. This shows you the list of catchments where this rule would apply. So it includes a big chunk of Southland, the Matara, the Ariti, the Waimakatua, the Aparima, the Waihopai. So those river systems would all be affected by this nitrogen rule. In the Waikato, Piako River would be captured and Piako is already part of Plan Change 1, which already has a similar proposal on the table. And in the Hauraki, the Waihau River, where we have also a thousand dairy farms, Bay of Plenty, some farms in Northland, some farms in Taranaki are also impacted by this rule. So what are we doing? So like I said, the devil's in the detail and there's an awful amount of detail that's being proposed here as part of all these documents. So the key thing that our team is doing is working through that detail and trying to understand what it means. What does it mean for the environment? What does it mean for water quality? What does it mean for communities and for farmers in the bottom line? And what does it mean for, for, for the communities that they support? So a big part of our work at the moment is to make sure we have a very strong and robust submission around the pieces that we support and the pieces that we do not support 
with the reasons why. So at the moment, we're midway through that analysis, but as you would have seen, we've already outlined some of our key positions that we believe are important moving forward. The second part is making sure that you're up to date, and this is why we've organized this webinar. Following the MFE roadshows, we've also gone around the country as well. We've already hosted meetings in Southland, in Ashburton, and we have a meeting in, uh, in the Hauraki tomorrow, and in Matamata next week, Palmerston North on Monday, and a number of meetings in Northland and Taranaki as well. So it's really important for us to be talking to you, to helping understand uh, your concerns, and to be taking that on board in our submission, and also advising you on what we believe are the key points that you need to be considering to submit on. We're also working with the milk companies, all the technical experts within the various milk companies, to make sure we have an industry agreed position on a lot of these policies. We know that's really important to be aligned up as an industry across all our milk companies, dairy and seed, and also federated farmers. And we're also working with beef and lamb and federated farmers and horticulture NZ to try and find a primary sector response to some of these very important policies. So at a high level, we support the intent. We, we support uh, the timeframes in a generation as long as that's well defined. We support it impacting all land users and all contaminants and adding sediment to it, for example. We support acceleration, accelerating regional council policy documents. We support a focus on ecosystem health, a farm plan approach, no further intensification in the interim and improving wintering practices and stock exclusion off the back of all the work we are already doing as a sector. But we don't support the proposed nitrogen and phosphorus bottom lines. We don't believe they will lead to the ecosystem health outcomes we're looking for in an effective way. And they absolutely don't consider the economic impact and the impact on our communities along the way. We don't support moving fence lines unnecessarily, not because we don't want to, but because it doesn't make sense. It's not going to lead to a significant improvement downstream by moving a fence by a metre or two if it's there already. We don't support multiple attributes. The attributes need to make sense. And we, we are very concerned about the lack of economic and social analysis. That's been undercooked. Nobody's looked at it in great detail. We know these policies will have big implications, particularly the N and P bottom line. And we need to understand that and understand it well before we start jumping into some of these policies. There are a number of things we're still working our way through, but we hope to have our positions finalized on these by the 17th of October. The first is around some of the big issues have not been dealt with. So when this policy was outlined in October last year, the intention was to resolve nutrient allocation, particularly iwi water allocation and iwi rights. And that's really important because until that's resolved, we're still hanging under a cloud of uncertainty. And we need that certainty given the amount of change on the table. So right now, nutrient allocation is not being addressed at all in this current policy document. We also have concerns around how the regional councils in the dairy sector and, and the primary sector in general will implement some of this stuff. There's a whole raft of new rules, new policies, new things which need to be measured. And the last thing we want is that while we support regional council policy processes being sped up, none of us want to wait a decade for the environment court process. We want to make sure that these things, these plan changes are done in a robust way. They can't be rushed through. They need to be done well with good science and they need to be practical. I should have added as well that the environment court process will no longer apply in the new proposed framework. The intention is that there is one crack at it, one crack to get it right, and there will be a hearings process by an independent panel without the right to go to environment court to relitigate everything. Farm plans, again, we support it, but the devil's in the detail around how they're implemented. Do we have the adequate capability, capacity, and are they practical? Do they build off the farm business? Do they build off what we're doing already? Who owns them? Who certifies them? Who audits them? How practical is it? How can we roll these out? Most importantly, to make sure that they're done well. They're not a tick box exercise, but to make sure that they will actually achieve the intended outcomes downstream for water quality. How do we manage nitrogen in surplus versus in loss versus farm plans? The science supporting buffers, pugging depth, and the lack of focus on catchment scale solutions, catchment by catchment, which we know really works. So all of these things we will, we will be submitting on and we will be sharing our positions on these over the coming weeks. And finally, we're uh, concerned about the connection to other policies, zero carbon bill, biodiversity, biosecurity, a whole lot of other things going on right now, um, soils. And we need to be make absolutely sure that where these things have implications for farmers, 
they're considered in a concerted way. So what we'd, we'd like you to do, like I said, this policy document is very, very important. It has a lot of implications for the whole of New Zealand, and it's really important that we get this right and that we all get our views across. So we would like you to submit on this. We'd like you to submit based on your personal stories, how these policies impact you, what they mean for your farm business, what is practical and what is not. And the government have signaled that they really want to hear from farmers and not just the sector, not just the industry. So it's really important from our perspective that you use this opportunity to put in your submission and to use your voice. There are three different ways you can submit at the moment. The first is online, following the MFE consultation document. So what's really important is that the government has parked a lot of the contentious issues uh, to the consultation document. So this consultation document has 78 questions and it's really asking for your opinion. Do you support the end limit, the P limit, farm plans being voluntary or mandatory, wintering practices, etc., etc. So a lot of these contentious issues that we are concerned about, that others are concerned about, are up for consultation. And it's really important that we submit on that and get our views across. So you can go online, follow the MFE link and fill in that template. You could also jot down your, your submission points in an email and send it directly to MFE. It doesn't need to be bureaucratic. It can simply be an email with a few paragraphs and just outlining your story. And finally, we're providing a submission template, as Darian said, to all our farmers from tomorrow in an email from Tim. And that template, if you click on it, will open up in your inbox, in your email browser, I should say. And you'll see a whole lot of the points that I've talked about already pre-populated in that email. And you can choose to use them or not and add your own story. So for more information, um, this webinar will be made available online. And we're also uh, sending regular updates from Dairy and Z. We're also talking at discussion groups and a number of key events coming up, as I mentioned. And the dates for all those events are online and available for you to, to, to attend as well on our web page. So thank you for your time. I'll now pass back to Caleb, who will run a small poll, and then we're happy to take uh, any questions that you may have. So we'll just run two polls now. The first one is to get a gauge of how comfortable you are with the essential freshwater package and get some of your thoughts about that. So we've got 30% of the boat in at the moment, 50%. It's rapidly ascending. 65. Got a good range of responses. At 75. Go for another 10 seconds or so. Close off the poll. And I'll share the results. So hopefully the results are up on your screen at the moment. Okay, so um, what we can see here is that 21% of you are comfortable with minor concerns. 48% are concerned and 28% are very concerned. And I think this kind of reflects um, the complexity of the policies and also how they affect our farms and catchments in different ways. Cool, we'll go on to the second poll now, which is just, have you or will you make a submission? So we'll just run it for about 30 seconds again. Fifty percent of people have voted. Seventy-five percent. Eighty percent. Give another five seconds. Okay, I'll close off the poll.
and share the results. Great, thank you. So um, the results in front of us show that 56% are going to make a submission, 27% uh, won't, and 17% don't know. So look, that's a great response. We would love you to put in a submission. Like I said, don't see it as a bureaucratic process. It could simply be an email with what you support, what you don't support, and our template will help you make that in one minute if you would like it uh, help with that. So we're now going to open it up to uh, questions and um, just jumping in here with Aslan wright though, who leads our environment team. And Aslan is lead leading our submission as well and doing all the technical work and the technical teams behind that. Um, are working with him on that. So um, welcome to Aslan and he, he and I are going to try and answer your questions as best as we can that have uh, come through via email. You can keep emailing these in as well. We um, will pick them up here and try and, and answer them as they come in. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everybody. The first question that's come through um, relates to urban waterways. So the question is that, um, that your presentation so far has not commented on urban waterway management. Do we intend, do you intend to comment on this in your submission? Uh, yes, look, absolutely. So I've not covered it off because um, we thought we would stick to the impacts on farmers. But in terms of water quality outcomes, in terms of managing the environment, it's absolutely important that we all do our bit, urban and rural. And for that reason, we will be um, commenting on the policy aspects and the technical aspects of the policies which impact the urban environment as well. So those policies are particularly, uh, like you said, to wastewater management and the standards and some of the regulations in terms of national bottom lines. Um, I should also add that there are a number of policies uh, which um, is existing hydroelectric power schemes would be exempt from. So six locations around the country would be considered exempt from the current policies because of hydroelectric power generation. Um, look, we're also a little bit concerned about that because we have many farms in some of those catchments, such as the Waihau, the Waihau, sorry, in Southland in the Manapuri scheme. And we don't want farmers to have to offset the impacts of hydro um, generation, hydroelectric generation schemes. So we'll also be commenting on that as well in our submission. And I'll just add to that, David, that there are this policy is obviously going to have a very major effect on the primary sector, in particular the dairy industry, but also the dry sector as well. But I think it's probably been undercooked a little bit to say that the, the proposals will have a pretty significant implication on the urban waterways as well. And so they're, they're not being left out of this, they are part of the, the process in the consultation documents. So the, the, the next question relates to, to how the policy or the proposals will um, will pick up the poor performers. And, and I guess there's a concern from a, a, a particular um, person watching the, um, listening in, that this, this farm is in, a, is in a catchment that's affected by a whole lot of other land use um, further upstream. How does the, how do the proposals plan to deal with those poor performers? Yeah, so look, what we, what we do like about the proposals is that there is a real focus on other contaminants, not only nitrogen. So in the past, um, these policies have had a real focus on nitrogen. And we know nitrogen management is important, but we also know that if we are looking at improving ecosystem health outcomes, water quality outcomes, we need to look at E. coli, we need to look at sediment, and we need to look at phosphate. And yes, while dairy contributes to those, those numbers, absolutely, but we also know that other land users, um, urban and rural, do as well. So the policies do impact, as Aslan said, rural and urban and all land users in these catchments um, in many different ways. So that will be addressed um, in these policies. Absolutely. So the, the next question relates to farm and environment plans. That's a key, um, key part of the proposal that's come through fairly strongly. The question is, shouldn't the emphasis um, on resourcing, et cetera, be around how those plans are going to be audited? And, and I know that we have some concerns as to the regional councils in terms of the resources required for not only getting every farmer to have a, a, a farm environment plan and be operating within a farm environment plan or to a farm environment plan, but how the auditing process will play out. Yeah, look, at what I didn't comment on is that there is a proposal in the document um, that the farm plans are carried out by a certified advisor. Uh, the certified advisor is, uh, meets a minimum requirement in terms of experience and qualifications. And the certified advisor is also uh, required to undertake an audit from time to time. So all these things are being worked through. Um, it's, for us, we'll be focusing quite heavily on this in our submission, uh, particularly around the policy aspects, but also the practicality around implementation. And you're absolutely right. We are concerned about the resourcing. 
um, and the capacity and making sure those things line up very nicely to what the dairy sector is already doing um, through our existing milk company schemes, and there are a lot of those, for example, from Terra's Tiaki program, and also lining up to the government, the other arm of the government, MPI, which is working on the integrated farm insurance plan, which I know Aslan has been heavily involved with as well. So all of the stuff does need to line up, it needs to be practical, but most importantly, it needs to consider the whole farm business and lead to meaningful outcomes for water quality and not be a tick box exercise. And just to add to that, David, the, the dairy sector is a long way. We're, we're far advanced to any other sector in this space. And the auditing, the auditing aspects of the sustainable dairy and water record is not new to us. So we have been involved in this process. And we know that farm environment plans do uh, garner great outcomes and hence our support for those. The next question is, do you have any idea of how the clawback for nitrogen and phosphorus will work in those high risk, high nitrogen catchments? Um, in short, no. The intention is that this document sets the overarching national policy or the national requirement that all regional councils need to meet. And if this policy goes and becomes, um, becomes law, then the regional councils will need to go back and work with their communities and their stakeholders to actually develop the plan around how they would do exactly that. Those plans must be in place by 2025 with one generation to meet it, and the community can decide what those timeframes are. Our concern is, of course, that you know, for regional councils to really get those plans notified by 2025, the work needs to happen in the next two or three years, ultimately by the end of 2023, which is only a couple of years down the track, and looking at the sheer volume of work and the scale across the whole country, uh, that's a significant concern. So to answer your question, the communities and regional councils will be required to come up with that. And, and I guess it's, it's key to point out that specific timeframes that, that I've talked about generational change and change within a generation. There's no point in the documents, and MFA have been quite clear on this, that the, that the timeframes for those changes aren't specified. They're something that need to be worked through with regional councils, with communities, with that broader catchment context. Mm -hmm. So that's the process. Um, for um, the, in terms of the timeframes. And as David points out, some ambiguity in terms of exactly how that uh, is likely to play out. A question here around submissions, David. Um, should submissions be made by everyone involved in a farm business, partners, share milkers, et cetera, or just one submission per farm? Uh, look, that's a really good question. I think what's really important is that the submission is unique and tells the personal story of how these policies impact you and your concerns about them. Um, of course, you can use our template as the basis of that. Um, but I do, yeah, do think it's really important to get some of those personal stories across. And, um, and for that reason, look, it's really important that we get as many submissions as possible. So I'll leave it up to you if you think it's, it's good for a, multiple submissions on a, on a farm. But it, it does affect, affect people differently, of course, these, what's on the table here. And just to encourage that overall numbers do count. We've, we've had strong indications that, that the number of submissions that we get through the door, through the MFE, uh, will be read firstly, and we've been told that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they will uh, they will be um, they, they will help inform the final decisions mm -hmm. that we're not expecting until around February, uh, end of January, February next year. Mm -hmm. the, the next question is relates to the advisory panel um, and. Why have the farmers who have been on that advisory panel, um, why have the farmers that have been on that advisory panel advised that the numbers are achievable, the numbers are, are doable? Yeah, so there are there were four advisory panels, and there were some members of those panels who have got a strong background in the dairy sector. Um, but what, what you will see, of course, in, in the consultation document, which which is very clear and, and transparent around some of this, is that there was a lot of conflict within the, within those groups and also across those groups or between those groups. And it just shows how complicated this stuff really is and how many different um, options there are and, 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 and sort of, yeah, how these things could be around, how these things could be implemented. So, um, yes, look, I'm sure that, um, that these things were talked about at length in those advisory groups and that those positions are, are well summarised in the consultation document in terms of where they landed and why and, and also highlighting that there was disagreement at times within those, those groups as well. It certainly wasn't a unanimous, unanimous decision across no. this in, in any of those groups from the reading um, that we've done. And I think that makes it quite quite a unique opportunity um, for the submission because the government has clearly you now wanting the views of the community on this. And the fact that there are 78 questions there that they want advice on and, and steer on, I think that's fantastic. And we need to grab that opportunity, um, even although we might not be happy with the timeframes and, and, and the way some of the stuff has gone. 
Um, just a, a simple question on drains, and, and obviously drains will affect um, and be a key part of farming systems in various parts of the country, Hauraki and Southland, for example. Um, the question is, are drains included in the stock exclusion and fencing requirements? Yeah, look, and that's a really good question and, and quite a confusing one. So drains are not included as part of the stock exclusion rules, and we think that's a good thing. Um, so the stock, the stock exclusion rules apply to permanent waterways as per, per the RMA definition, wider than a metre, deeper than 30 centimetres, so the accord definition, and not to drains. Um, the drains is a particular uh, concern to farmers in the Wairapa, for example, and the Hauraki Southland, where a lot of drains are on these farms, and also that adequate, that buffer widths need to be small enough to allow uh, diggers to maintain the, 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 the maintenance of those drains, which are required by law to, to ensure that the water can uh, can be discharged from those catchments, so the rating curves and what have you. So, and just to note that there's a, there's a range of inconsistencies across, across regional councils. Some recent work that we had never do uh, came up with up to 10 different definitions of what a drain or an artificial uh, drainage network um, uh, uh, contained. The, the next question was more uh, of a comment, really, and a, and a statement, and, and uh, essentially expressed a little bit of disappointment in the number of polls who said that. The, the people who are tending who said that they weren't intending on adding a submission. So I guess we would completely agree that the, of the importance, and I hope we've made that clear in terms of the the, the conversations that we're having with the, with the MFE and what we're hearing is that they will listen, mm -hmm. uh, that they will read these things, um, and that they will take note. Yes, yeah, so look, from our perspective, this is, this is an opportunity for everybody to put in their voice and please use it. It's really important that everybody submits on this and around what this means and what they support and what they don't support. So I absolutely agree with that comment. We need as many submissions as we can to go in and we can guarantee that we have plenty of other submissions from other parts of the community as well. Yeah, so, so we're not the only one using the, the template submission. Um, we know that there's a whole bunch of other groups who are doing the same thing. So it's, we've made it as simple as we can and, and as easy as possible, simply opening, clicking. You can delete the sections or any parts that you're not happy with, mm -hmm. hitting submit, and then, and then that will carry quite a lot of weight. The next question relates to, the, I guess, the differences between uh, in surplus and, and in loss. Um, the, 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 the in surplus being obviously the, more of an inputs and the in loss being an, an, an outputs. But it, it put simply, is there any other fundamental differences between the two approaches? Yeah, so, so nitrogen surplus is about um, the difference between inputs and outputs and how efficiently that nitrogen is used on that farm. Um, and nitrogen loss is basically how much of that nitrogen is lost from the farm gate. And nitrogen loss takes into consideration climatic factors rainfall, for example, and soil type. So we know that in environments, um, so where you might have an equivalent farm practice or equivalent inputs, the actual loss of nitrogen can be hugely different simply because of a higher rainfall environment or a different soil type. Um, so we believe in the first instance, it's really important to start managing nitrogen surplus in terms of improving practices. That's very much in line with our good farming practice water quality action plan. And, um, and look, we believe that some of these harder conversations around nutrient loss, particularly for some areas, needs to come as part of the nutrient allocation and the community process. So um, why punish farmers who happen to have a farm in the wrong location? So you might have the best practice or a very low nitrogen surplus number, but still a high nitrogen loss number if you happen to be on a certain soil type with a high rainfall environment. The, the, the next question relates to a lot of the work that we're doing here. The NZ, of course, is a research-based um, organisation. So the question is, who is involved in carrying out the essential research required to provide the science for national policies? Mm -hmm. Is it independent? Is it unbiased? So in terms of the advisory groups, um, the technical advisory group um, established by the government included 16 scientists from a range of organisations, including universities and, and um, the national institutes. And um, so they, they reviewed a lot of the existing science and they came up with some of these methodologies and some of the some of these policies, some of which the government accepted and some of these some of which the government didn't actually use. And you can find that all back in the consultation document. Um, look, it's really look for us this is a really important point um, because we're going through this very carefully with what we believe is a very strong science team and with a good science look. Um, of course we work for dairy, so people may not perceive us as being independent. But I can assure you that the rigour 
and the, the qualities we're bringing to our submission are underpinned by the science first. And we are also working with some independent people um, from outside DRNZ to help guide us in that. So it, the independent science is very, very important, but we know that some of that's been a little bit clouded in recent times with lots of uh, different swaying opinions on some of the stuff. And you'll notice, of course, that there's a very active, um, there's a very active topic in the media at the moment with all sorts of opinions and, and op-eds and a lot floating around. Um, I, I guess I would just build on that to say that um, the, the, we're looking to have our submission ready on the 17th, as, as mm -hmm. you've already pointed out. And we'll be covering a lot of the technical science stuff in there, and, and we've gone to great pains to ensure that we're referencing uh, independent peer-reviewed science. So, so the basis of, of our um, our submission uh, is is research-based. It's it's science-based. The, the next, sorry, I was just going to uh, question just coming through around um, why is the government ignoring some of this this research? I think, look, the, the minister put this to the advisory groups. And, and assume the advisory groups would give a, a great answer and a consistent answer. And look, the stuff is very complicated. And we saw that last week when the new land Aotearoa water, sorry, land and water, uh, uh, lower, the lower reports came out last week and they showed quite different numbers in the year before. So this stuff is very, very difficult, very, very challenging. Um, but I can assure you we'll be putting forward the best submission that we can. And we hope our submission around nitrogen and phosphate in particular is well aligned to the regional councils as well. That's what we're hoping in terms of we are using the regional council sites to help inform some of our decisions around this. And just building on that question, it says that why is government ignoring this research? Um, we've been assured um, and both through formal and informal conversations with the ministry and, um, and MFE and central government that they are listening, uh, that they're very, very keen in particular to see the Dairy NZ submission, knowing that it will be underpinned by some of the best science that we can get our hands on. And again, in, in unbiased, you know, we're looking for outcomes. We agree with the intent. Um, the outcomes need to be based on, on research that will make a difference. If we're asking for large changes in catchments, we want certainty and insurance mm -hmm. to the best that we can, that we will get outcomes, uh, the outcomes sought from that. Mm -hmm. The next question relates to a Schedule 1 catchment, and, and, and these are the, some of the catchments that David alluded to in his presentation and, and have come up. But I live in one of these Schedule 1 catchments in Taranaki. What will this mean for how I farm, and what should I do about it? What should I be doing about it? Yeah, so, so right now, I think, um, yeah, nothing, because at the end of the day, we, we're waiting to see where all these submissions get us. We're waiting to see where the government's going to land on the final policy direction and the policy intent and, and actual detail within those policies. It will be up to the regional councils to then start implementing some of these proposed changes if, it, if it's in law. And that will happen over the next few years. So right now, look, I can't tell you whether the DIN number, the phosphate number will end up in legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point in time, just keep doing what you're doing around good farming practices and farm plans and what have you, and, and the rest will come later. There's no cause for concern um, at this point in time it, it, as mentioned, we're, we're, we've been told that announcements will be made uh, probably the, the um, end of February and yeah. around that sort of period. So continue with doing what you're doing. Yeah, I, think, I think I'd just like to add to that as well that you know, we, we believe the future is very bright for dairy. Um, yes, these policies have big implications, but a lot of this builds off the good work that farmers are already doing and that we have committed to for dairy tomorrow. Of course, some other stuff we don't agree with and we'll be working hard to find a better way forward. Um, but we believe, despite, you know, we know that it's, a, it's, it's um, farmers are feeling they're getting a bit of a hammering in the space at the moment with multiple policies, you know, carbon, zero carbon bill, water quality and all the rest of it. But we do believe, um, yes, while it's tough at the moment, we do believe there's a bright future for dairy. Um, this is, yeah, so just bear that in mind. Um, Although and, these policies are concerning, of course. And, and bear in mind, too, that, that we, we've got a, a very, very competent team working as hard as we possibly can in the background to inform this. We've got just a couple more minutes, and, um, including a, a wrap up. So, so we'll just finish with a, a, a political question, if you like. But if, if National gets in, and, and we do have a, a, an election cycle coming up um, yeah. next year, if, if National gets in, I know it's crystal ball gazing and that sort of stuff, but are we anticipating any differences to the outcomes or changes to this policy? Yeah, I, th I think the challenge for the government at the moment is getting agreement across all parties, the Greens, Labour, and New Zealand first. So we know that's going to be very challenging for them and very difficult, but that's the, the nature of, of the current government. 
Um, we also know that the national government was already on the way to implement, implementing some of the stuff before they lost power. So the national objectives framework, the national policy statement for fresh water and the proposed stock exclusion rules in particular uh, were developed initially by the national government when they were already in. So um, to answer your question, I, I don't know. I, I Look, I do. I know that it's the intent to get all of this into law in the, in the coming months before the election. I think they'll get quite far with that. But I think I, I can't answer your question absolutely around refinement, but there's still a lot of water to go under the bridge in terms of getting consensus within the current government around this this policy package before we even consider October or whatever that is around the next election. Very good. All right, we'll, we'll finish up there. Um, I, I just my, my parting comment would be just to say um, keep keep going, keep your head up, <laughs> keep your chin up. I know that you guys have done a hell of a lot of stuff, and we're making sure that that comes through loud and clear. Government is listening to what we're saying, um, both in terms of the submission that we're putting together, but also reflecting back on the, the work that we've done in the environmental space, in the water quality space over the last decade. And, and that stuff is stuff that, as a sector, I think we should be very proud of, and we'll ensure that we are building on that. So, so the future is good. It, it looks good. It's going to be challenging, but the future is good. So I would, I'll, I'll finish up there and pass over to David. Yeah, look, thank, thanks very much for your time. And like I've said a few times already, I'm sorry for saying it again, um, really important to get your submission in, absolutely important. Uh, we'll do the best we can to cover off the detail around policies and water quality and economics and what have you. And a lot of that information will be shared with you over the coming few weeks. We are aiming to have all our submission points summarized um, in detail by the 17th of October. Having said that, our overarching positions that you'll see in the template won't change but you can expect to see more detail for, from us around some of these questions you've had today over the coming weeks. Um, but like I said, please get your submission in as well. And if there's anything we can do to help you, uh, please join us at these events over the coming few weeks or give us an email or give us a call and we'll do the best we can to, to support you. So thanks for your time and um, yeah, please look at our webpage for more information. Thank you.